Welcome to another episode of the Sermapod, the podcast for the Sports and Entertainment Risk Management Alliance. I am your guest host, Matt Liller, and today I have the pleasure of welcoming attorney Steve Edelman, the founder of Edelman Law Group. He focuses his practice on safety and security at live events. Steve is the president of the Event Safety Alliance, the deputy chair of the Global Crowd Management Alliance. He's authored several American national standards on event safety and is the co-host of the Event Safety Podcast. A big welcome to Steve. Uh, thank you, Matt, and uh, welcome, Surma podcast listeners. Um, <laughs> I don't usually get to say it that way, so this is pretty fun. Well, so Steve, we're going to jump right into your area of expertise, uh, safety and security at live events. And I want to talk about uh, standards and safety standards in that space. So oftentimes lawyering can end up being an analysis of whether a, a person or an entity was reasonable under the circumstances without a whole lot of guidance or guideposts as to you know what standard might be expected of them. And so I understand in the event safety space, there are actually a number of published standards. And so, Steve, can you tell us what the term safety standard means and where they come from? Sure. Um, so well teed up question. Um, watch me go. <laughs> so lawyers, you will recognize when we talk about standards, we're talking about the standard of care. So this is tort law now. We're talking about the standard of care. And there's kind of a hierarchy of things that are authoritative about what the standard of care might be. In an ideal universe, which is to say not sports and entertainment, uh, there are standards, there are regulations, there is codified guidance that has been promulgated and written in calligraphy and, you know, things that are published and it becomes law. That's not our world. So if you're looking for a standard, uh, sorry, if you're looking for a statute, um, probably not. If you are looking for a regulation, occasionally there will be something from OSHA, so the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So there may be OSHA regs, um, particularly if you're in a state such as California, Cal OSHA has promulgated its own state safety and health regulations. Um, there's also Fed OSHA, obviously. Um, other than that, there are portions of some fire codes, such as the um, International Fire Code, but even that is so haphazard. Many jurisdictions do not codify any fire code, and those that do kind of pick and choose which portions they want, and almost invariably they're using something other than the current fire code. So statutes, no. Not in the world of sports and entertainment events. Uh, regulations, rarely, um, and often not the most current. Oh, well, that's unpleasant. So what else is there if not stuff passed by legislators or, you know, their unhappy aides who have to wear ties in the summertime? What else is there? Well, now we're in the world of consensus industry standards, consensus industry standards. Well, let's break that down. A consensus of whom? Well, if it's a consensus industry standard, that's going to be a consensus of people who work in the industry. What industry? Oh yeah, we're talking about sports and entertainment. So in the field of consensus industry standards relevant to sports and entertainment venues, and the operation of those venues when human beings occupy them. There is sort of the granddaddy of them all. Don't mean that to be gendered. It's just the way it came out. Uh, so I'm now holding up my copy of NFPA 101 Life Safety Code. That's the way you say it, the Life Safety Code. This is the 2021 edition. It's the most current one. That's why I'm holding it. it comes out every three years. There'll be another one that comes out later this year. and. I mean, I'm holding it up this way now so you can see this is a fat volume. And if I were to open it, you'll see very small font size. So there's a lot of guidance in here. 
but it's the National Fire Protection Administration uh, Association. So NFPA, fires, what do fires have to do with um, sports and venue event operations and the spaces in which they take place? Well, a uh, bit of history lesson here. It used to be that fires were very, very bad and not uncommon occurrences in built structures. So the NFPA Life Safety Code, which what I'm holding, uh, was originally called the Building Exits Code of 1927. That was the first one. And it was a direct reaction to the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire of 1907. Check me and put it in the show notes. Uh, in which about a hundred um, almost entirely young female factory workers in a tenement um, stitching factory in uh, lower Manhattan, um, they died either by smoke inhalation um, or jumping out of windows because the fire exits were blocked. And the fire exits were blocked for a reason that um, was, again, not uncommon in the early 20th century. They didn't want the girls taking home cloth because that was money that the factory owners wanted to keep. So they locked the building exits. Anyway, from that tragic beginning came the life safety code. So fire marshals, back to the present, fire marshals care very much about getting people safely out of burning buildings, buildings, built structures. Well, in the world of sports and entertainment, we have a lot of built structures, whether they're indoors or outdoors, almost certainly they meet the definitions that begin the life safety code. So there is some material in this fat treatise, this industry, this consensus industry standard that applies to live sports and entertainment events. There's also an awful lot in here that has nothing to do with live sports and entertainment events. So there is some guidance in this life safety code, but it still doesn't get us particularly far. It leaves many, many, many operational decisions still without any, any guidance about what the standard of care would be. What else could there be? Well, let's stay in the world of consensus industry standards. So the NFPA Life Safety Code is basically a fire code, like the International Fire Code. Legislatures can adopt in whole or in part any portion of, well, any edition of the Life Safety Code that they want. So this one is the 2021 edition, again, most current as of today. But that doesn't mean that a legislature couldn't adopt the preceding version, the 2018 edition. I have that in my bookcase over my shoulder. Um, or the 2015 edition, I have that too. So they could kind of do whatever they want. Some jurisdictions have adopted bits and pieces of the life safety code. Nobody that I'm aware of has adopted all of it. Again, it is an incredibly dense, diverse document, all fundamentally intended for fire marshals. So in our world of sports and entertainment, we still don't have, in this discussion, um, more granular guidance for us. Well, um, Matt gave me a lovely introduction. Um, one of the credentials that you mentioned, Matt, was that I'm vice president of a group called the Event Safety Alliance. ESA um, came out with something called the Event Safety Guide. So like the props in this one. Uh, so the Event Safety Guide is another consensus document. A bunch of us had a hand in writing it. Frankly, I didn't write any of it. I edited some of it, um, not taking more credit than I should. Um, but my organization, the Event Safety Alliance, promulgated the Event Safety Guide back in late 2013, early 2014, following another disaster, in that case, the 2011 Indiana State Fair stage roof collapse. Seven people died in that one. And we created the event safety guide because, well, as much as 
things like the life safety code are incredibly valuable. They leave so much out that is specific to the operation of live sports and entertainment events. So we tried to fill that gap. Period. But that still doesn't get us to things that can be cited as the standard of care with a great deal of confidence. For that, for the level of increased confidence that we really have something that represents a consensus industry standard, for that, there is one best source, and that is the American National Standards Institute. So ANSI. So if you ever see something that is A-N-S-I something, it has been blessed by the American National Standards Institute. And my organization, the Event Safety Alliance, partnered with another organization, ESTA, the Event Services and Technology Association, to create event safety ANSI standards. And so last prop for this podcast, um, I'm holding up ANSI ES 1.9-2020 crowd management. So this is the American national standard for crowd management. And what that is, is a consensus industry standard, which has the gravitas that the NFPA life safety code does, but it is specific to the production and operation of live entertainment events, <clears throat> excuse me, at least as far as front of house crowd management issues. So, you know, the life safety code talks about egress with, for example, from a fire marshal standpoint, the fire marshal always is thinking first about getting people out of a burning building. And they understand that, you know, smoke drops from high to low. So if people are crouching down and, you know, basically doing a frog walk along the floor. How much width do they need over how much time so that they don't die of smoke inhalation before they get out to fresh air? The ANSI standard for crowd management is not at that level of fire marshal specificity. Rather, we're talking to the people who are making site planning determinations, um, who are thinking about how much time it would take to move a crowd from some place of danger to some place which is safer. Um, all of the operational decisions that a crowd manager has to make cannot possibly be written in a treatise that is written for fire marshals. It has to be written for people who are making operational decisions. And so what we try to do with this American national standard for crowd management and other similar American national standards about different aspects of event safety is to help the people who have to make those decisions, which are different from every show, every event, every sporting event, every one of those is different, is to help them ask better questions. The answers will be different for every show. I mean, you could have an indoor arena which hosts a basketball game one night, a hockey game two nights later, and the night after that, once they get the ice up, it can host a concert. And that's how that's how arenas work. That's how they are economically viable. So the people who run that building have to make operational decisions for three different types of crowds, three different configurations of space. Granted, the exits will always be in the same place, but the people in the building are thinking differently, behaving differently, maybe impaired differently. You know, crowd at a hockey game may be different in its level of attention and awareness than at a concert. And the concert crowd may be different if it's a country show than if it's an EDM show. So what we do with these event safety American national standards is try to point out what are the most reasonably foreseeable safety issues? And then how can you think through the different ramifications of those safety issues so that you can come up with a reasonable, number one, a reasonable risk assessment, 
And then number two, based on your reasonable risk assessment, a reasonable risk mitigation strategy. So there, I'll, I'll take a breath in a moment, but notice how, Matt, when you, when you teed up my question 15 minutes ago, you used the key words. The risk assessment has to be reasonable. We're talking about standard of care. And what I have done with this little show and tell is indicate different ways that lawyers, if something goes to litigation, different ways that lawyers can figure out what is the standard of care in the operation and decision making for a live entertainment or sporting event. And what I prefer is that, you know, Surma podcast listeners, if you have access to and influence with people who are making these decisions, give them these resources. Make sure that they are aware that even if the answers have to be made on an individual event by event, site by site basis, the questions, the basic framework of assessing risk and then determining, kind of sifting through your resources so that you can mitigate the risk in a reasonable fashion, the way to address those challenges is similar across events. Analytically, the analysis is largely the same. The specifics, the proper nouns will be different. That's why it's an important exercise to do for every show, every venue, every demographic who's coming in, every staffing change. All of these change the dynamics enough. That's why you do an incident plan for every event, whatever you call it, whether it's an emergency action plan or emergency response plan or whatever you call that document, that thing, that conversation that you have where you're thinking about risk and what you can do to mitigate it. What we've done, you know, the Event Safety Alliance through these anti-standards and piggybacking off of existing resources like the Life Safety Code, what we've done is try to help people figure out what are the questions that I need to ask and how can I go about answering them. That's awesome, Steve. And, and piggybacking off of that, you know, if the ANSI standards are to let the the proper people ask the right questions, I want to dig in just a little bit deeper. And can you give us a concrete example of, you know, what are some of these questions and what are some of these situations specifically that we're looking at um, such that, you know, we can talk about how, you know, the clients, the the event spaces, and even maybe lawyers are actually using <clears throat> the ANSI codes or the ANSI guidelines um, to to analyze those questions. Sure. So just at random, I opened my ANSI ES 1.9-2020 crowd management, and I came upon 4.2.3, signage. Um, so signage is about things like wayfinding signage. Wayfinding signage, who cares? How hard can it be? You slap up an exit sign, good to go. Not so much. Because you want people to know where they are on site and how to get where they want to or need to go. Well, how difficult could that be? It turns out it's actually quite difficult because you have to think through what information do people need. Well, here comes the situational awareness bugaboo. People refer to situational awareness like it's like it's obvious, like it's a real thing. Um, I'm a bit of a contrarian about this. When people refer to situational awareness, mostly, not me, mostly what I think they're referring to is, oh, everyone has a basic level of awareness, um, which is loosely embodied in the term, see something, say something. We've all seen that language, you know, go to the airport or wherever, you know, lots of arenas have, you know, some sign, see something, say something, often with an eyeball. Um, it's very memorable signage. Um, it's also wrong and kind of dumb. So let's work through why, and then we'll come back to 4.2.3 signage. Um, here, Matt, let's just do this together. We, we haven't practiced this. So 
you go to an arena. Where are you located? I'm in Roanoke, Virginia. Roanoke, Virginia. You know, what's the nearest college athletic event space? Virginia Tech is about okay. 30 minutes from me. All right. So you're going to go to a Virginia Tech game. Um, you get from your tailgate. Well, what are you, are you tailgating? Sure. Great. What are you doing when you tailgate other than, you know, chatting with friends? What's the activity during tailgating? Usually there's an alcoholic beverage in there. There you go. So there's an alcoholic beverage. And I didn't mean to embarrass you. I was just kind of making an assumption. And I don't know you well enough, but that seemed like a fair guess. So, okay. Your general level of baseline awareness that you have right now, even though it's Friday afternoon, doesn't look like you've started early. So you're at a tech game, you've just tailgated, maybe your awareness is slightly less than usual. You go through the bag check and pat down, now you're inside the stadium. What are you looking for? Might be my seat. Might be a restroom, might be the the uh, concession stand. Great. Seat, restroom, concession stand. Um, are you a big Virginia Tech fan? Not personally. Ah. Um, do you know any? Maybe somebody might like some merch? Absolutely. Okay, so maybe you're looking for merch. Do you have friends? You seem like a nice guy. You probably do. Absolutely. So maybe you're looking for friends, maybe old friends. I don't know. Maybe you're looking for some new friends. That happens too. Uh, so there are things that people are looking for, all of which are important. Think that's fair to say? Absolutely. Um, let's talk about something that you're probably not thinking so actively about, which is, um, is there somebody who has bad intent, who has left say, a Virginia Tech-branded uh, knapsack just randomly on the concourse floor and walked away. Are you looking for that? Absolutely not. You know who else isn't looking for that? Everyone. Everyone. No one's looking for that. So that suggests the level of situational awareness. It is slightly less than normal because you enjoyed some tailgating. And then it's a lot less than normal because you're there to have fun. Your attention is intentionally drawn by big signs for F&B and big signs for merch and signs that you care about that aren't quite as big, but you're looking for them for where are the restrooms and where is your section and the place is crowded and noisy and you're not you don't live there, so it's unfamiliar. Even if you go periodically, it's not like your home or your office. So our attention is significantly diminished and distracted. Situational awareness? No, we don't see something, say something. Instead, the correct use of situational awareness, I contend, is our level of awareness is a function of our situation. So in the situation that we have just conjured up of you going to a Virginia Tech game, your attention is reasonably foreseeably diminished. You're not going to see something say something. You're going to look for the things that you care about and you're gonna see those and you're gonna have significant tunnel vision and also tunnel hearing, by the way. So. That's why there needs to be good wayfinding signage. Oh, yeah, we were talking about signage. Um, that was what you asked about. Um, and the reason signage needs to be good is because of all of the things with which it is competing. So when I give a presentation about signage, which sounds boring, but in fact is really cool because you can kind of see the, the dawning recognition, that, that sinking, oh crap feeling as folks realize through the pictures that I show that I have taken from other people's event sites. Oh no, I do that too at our show, at our venue, at our festival ground. So one of the pictures that I show 
<clears throat> is from a festival just before the pandemic. Totally innocuous picture. It's a, a food and beverage vendor outside. It's an outside festival. And there's a giant inflatable Jack Daniels bottle on top of the F&B trailer. And the giant inflatable Jack Daniels bottle is visible quite far away. And that's great if your primary interest is in selling Jack, which clearly it was for that F&B vendor. The problem, which I did not have to work very hard to identify, is what is right next to the trailer with the giant Jack bottle on top which is the relatively much smaller exit sign, which was kind of like a windsock. So not only was it much lower than the giant inflatable bottle of Jack Daniels, so it wasn't in your line of sight, but also because it turned in the wind, this little exit sign, it was essentially invisible because the wind was blowing. And I show this sign and I just let it sink in what do you see here? That's the question I ask. What do you see? It is the most open-ended question I can think of. What do you see? And then I just let whoever I'm training, I let them answer. And generally they say, oh, you know, I see a F&B card. Great. Uh, oh, I see a Jack bottle. And they laugh. I see a gate. Terrific. And then finally they get to, oh, what, what is that? Oh yeah, it's a it's a sign that says exit, but it's kind of turns so that you can't really see it and besides it's way too low and I say, "Right. Is that reasonable under the circumstances?" And I by then I've taught them what reasonable under the circumstances means. These are event operators, they don't speak law. Um and they, you know, sort of guffaw and most of them look down at something important on their desk all of a sudden. It's very important to look down. Because they realize, oh, I never thought about signage like that. And then, you know, the next image that I'll show will be the last dopey image. I don't have these right now. Maybe I'll give them to you for the show notes. Um, is oftentimes there are signs on the fencing that lead people into the the shoot where they're going to present their ticket and then go through bag check and pat down. So there's always fencing, you know, because you have to get people into the right lines. It's a swell idea to put something up on the fencing. It's more aesthetically pleasing that way. The thing that you should not put on fencing, which is intended to get people to walk through a shoot, is the list of prohibited items. Um, that's another form of signage. It's important. You want people to know what they can and cannot bring. And also the, you know, fan code of conduct. You want them to know what they can and cannot do. If you're first showing that at the point of ingress, um, it's too late. Um, lots of states in the United States allow different levels of weapons carrying. And if the first time that you let them know that they cannot bring their personal weapon into the venue is when they are just about to present their ticket, they're going to, number one, be noncompliant, number two, angry, number three, they don't want to go back to their pickup truck to hang their rifle back in the gun rack in the back window. They don't want to. Why? Because they just walked a half mile from their pickup truck. They don't want to do that. That's your best case scenario is they're angry because they just learned the rules. So you want the rules to be posted at the point of sale on the website. But also the height. So if you are so foolish as to say, well, I'm going to post the list of prohibited items on the fencing, you know, at the point of ingress where people are walking in. If you make that choice, the fence has to be high enough so that people can see it. And the picture that I show, again, totally ordinary. I got lots of these pictures, is fencing that is, uh, you know, I'm 5'10". It's about up to a little below my shoulder height. And it's got the list of prohibited items on it. And so I ask people, and it, I took the picture before gates open. So you can see it. You can tell what it is. And then I ask, 
what are people going to make of this sign um, once gates open? And the first instinct is, well, it's, the sign's kind of hard to read. You know, the font size is not so big. And I let that thought, you know, go through the room. You know, people percolate on that. Oh, font size, you know, very important. Yes, font size is important. And then somebody realizes, oh, when there are a lot of people there, it's not going to be visible except to the person right next to it. And I say, yes, that's true because the signage is not high enough, you know, back to our, you know, Jack Daniels inflatable on top of a F and B cart. And I say, how about the location of that sign? Is that significant? And I often get quizzical looks and I say, what are people doing at that particular location? So it's, it's the shoot going in to where people need to present their ticket, you know, usually on their phone. So they're presenting their ticket and then they're going to go through bag check and pat down. So what are people doing at that point of the venue going experience? They're walking. So at this point, because I am physically active and always looking to get my steps at this point, I will start walking around the room, walking like I would walk for a show that I wanted to see. And if I'm a typical concert goer, so entertainment sermopod listeners, if I'm a typical concert goer and I'm getting there sort of when gates open, I can tell you with a high degree of confidence what those people are about to do. They're about to sprint to the merch area. That's what they do. They sprint to the merch area because they need a t-shirt. It's not a want. It is almost a chemical imbalance that needs to be corrected. So I am physically walking around the room with this, this banner hanging from fencing up on the screen. And finally, somebody says, oh yeah, they're walking. They're not looking slightly down and to the side to read a banner that's hung from fencing. They're not reading it. Even if the font size was bigger, they're not reading it because they're going somewhere. They're going, they're moving. They're not stopping to read a long bullet point list of prohibited items. They don't care about the fan code of conduct in that location. It's too late. It does not matter what the signage says at all at that point. The location has rendered it mute, ineffective. So you asked a question. I just randomly open up to signage, and there is a discussion about signage in here, in this ANSI standard. And without going into the incredible detail that I just went into, which I obviously can do rolling out of bed in the morning, we try to prompt people to ask reasonable questions. And last thought, when I say we, um, I'm speaking personally here. I was the leader of the task group that created ANSI ES 1.9-2020 crowd management, um, as well as self-promotion here, um, ANSI ES 1.40-2023 event security. I led that task group also. So I'm a big believer in having standards because it aggravates me when people loosely discuss what the standard of care is when there could be an actual written standard. And so in a field, and here I'm kind of trying to tie this into a bow right now, in a field such as sports and entertainment, where the industry is driven by ticket sales because there's no such thing as record sales anymore, and live performance of sporting events is basically the same economic model. So, you know, without casting aspersion on my friends who do intellectual property, respectfully, the money is in tushies and seats. And so I care very much about how we put on these events and that they happen safely. There is not a lot of traditional standard of, of care material. There aren't statutes. Um, there is relative little regulation. There are a few fat codes, such as the life safety code, which are invaluable. 
but don't speak directly to the operation of live events. So I'm a big believer in trying to fill in the gaps where we can with things like American national standards. And that's why I work on writing. So. Steve, thank you so much. Steve Edelman of Edelman Law Group. Uh, Please check out Steve's podcast, The Event Safety Podcast, where Steve will talk about these and many, 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 many other compelling uh, events and and thoughts in the event safety pod in the, in the event safety world. Rather, Steve, thank you so much for dropping some some knowledge on us today. Please come back to the Sermon Pod and and give us some more knowledge in the near future. Thanks, Matt, and thank you, Sermon Pod listeners. <laughs>